Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tabula Savalidis, and I'm the executive director of the Nassau County Medical Society and the Nassau Academy of Medicine. We want to welcome you to our webinar this evening on health literacy. Before I introduce you to our guest speaker, I just wanted to let everyone know that you'll be muted during the presentation. At the end, we'll have a Q&A uh, portion where you can type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, and our speaker will address any questions that come in. Our speaker today is Dr. Anthony Santella. Dr. Santella is an Associate Professor of Public Health at Hofstra University, where he teaches in the Graduate Public Health Programs and Undergraduate Community Health and LGBTQ uh, Studies Programs. He's also a public health consultant and scientist specializing in infectious disease prevention and control, and has interests in HIV, AIDS, sexually transmitted diseases, and emerging illnesses like COVID-19. His research helps improve the health and well-being of several vulnerable communities, including people who are living with and at risk for HIV AIDS, gender and sexual minorities, justice involved persons, youth, and people who are experiencing homelessness. Without further ado, Dr. Anthony Santella. Okay, thank you. Um, it's nice to be here with you and talk to you about health literacy, a super important topic that unfortunately remains a huge issue in both medicine and the population health disciplines like health administration and public health. So um, I'm happy to be here tonight. So I first like to turn to you and say, you know, when I say health literacy, what comes to mind? For everyone, it's a little bit different. Um, and depending on how, you know, when you got your training, how long you've been practicing, um, and your own experiences as a consumer of health, um, it may mean different things. So I'm going to come back to this in a few moments. The first point is health literacy impacts everyone. If you see this map of the US, you'll see that um, the the darker shades, so like the orange and reds, represent areas that have quote unquote low health literacy and the shades of green represent areas that have higher levels of health literacy. And so there's a sprinkling of green and red everywhere. So it's not like you can say, you know, I'm in this pocket of the country or in this state and this is not our problem. This is everyone's problem. And if you drill down and look at just New York State, you can see whether you're talking about Long Island, the five boroughs, you know, uh, upstate, um, there's a sprinkling of green and red. Now, there's been quite a bit of work that's looked at assessing health literacy in the American public. And you, what you see on the right side is the breakdown. So, you know, basically about a third, a little more than a third of Americans are at basic or below basic levels of health literacy. And you can see the examples there on the far right column, things like, you know, giving two reasons a person with no symptoms of disease should be tested. Think about, you know, COVID, people are asymptomatic, et cetera. Or the below basic, find it a date on an appointment slip or identify what is permissible to drink before a medical test. Um, based on a short set of instructions. The majority um, are at intermediate or proficient, but only 12% you know, are truly proficient when it comes to health literacy. This is one of those things where I think we overestimate our abilities to really understand, comprehend, digest, and take action based on information. And while it's been a longstanding issue for a number of years, it became elevated um, with the uh, Affordable Care Act because it defined health literacy as a degree to which a person has the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information so that they can make appropriate actions. Sometimes we think about it just as in terms of processing information, but it's the whole spectrum of obtain, communicate, process, and understand. And there are a lot of things that impact health literacy such as um, your client or patient's receipt of appropriate health communication materials. I'm gonna talk about materials towards the end of this presentation. It's also based on the ability to interpret health related information and engage in open communication with a provider. Much easier said than done. So when it comes to communication skills, we need to reflect on how well our health professionals, and by health professionals, I mean everyone from the medical assistant to the nurse, to the MPPA, to the physician, surgeon, whoever, um, can explain important health messages and make sure that their client or patient understands them. 
and have the, has the health professional actually been trained in issues around health literacy? Um, and the answer is usually no, which is why I'm, I'm happy to do this service because it's often something that's really glossed over in most professional training programs. The other factor that we have to consider is the complexity of information. You know, people, I don't care if you're um, uh, someone who has a, like a scribe or a medical system with a high school degree, or you're someone with an MD or PhD, you have more advanced knowledge than the average person. And oftentimes when we have a lot of knowledge, we feel that we have to like showcase that knowledge to everyone. And so we make things a lot more complicated than they really need to be. It's actually a much uh, stronger and more difficult skill set to take a complex piece of information and break it down into plain language. Um, and so, you know, are you really telling people what they need to know versus what's nice to know? And are you communicating it in a way that that removes all that jargon, the terminology, the acronyms, the unnecessary statistics, um, so that that person can be as informed as possible. Clearly, culture and, and linguistics are um, another key ingredient when it comes to health literacy. Um, this is much easier said than done. I was with a group of providers earlier today, and we were looking at some data that showed like the preferred language of clients that they serve. And it was, it, it was something like, you know, um, two thirds English, a third Spanish or something like that. So I said, I was like, you know, where are the clients who were speaking other languages like Creole or a South Asian language? Well, we have some people like that or we can offer, because we're a large health system, we can offer translation or interpreter services, you know, anytime. But I was like, if you don't have the staff who speak the language, why would someone who that's their preferred language want to come see you? They, they don't. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you need to have a staff that truly represents the culture and the languages of the people you're trying to serve. And that oftentimes is difficult, particularly when you're talking about advanced uh, skilled providers, adding on being, you know, knowing two or three languages is sometimes can be a difficult task. And are we communicating, particularly written materials, in the languages that they prefer? Um, and, you know, that's not difficult to do because there are a lot of services that can be paid, you know, that can, you can pay to do that. You know, like, for example, the city health department translates all health related information into the 12 most common languages spoken by New Yorkers. Now, not every office can do that, but, you know, you might be, it might go a long way to have something translated into maybe the top two or three languages of the people you're serving. Just because they can speak English doesn't mean, or understand English, doesn't mean that it's their preferred way of being communicated with. We also need to think about information dissemination. Um, who are the trusted people that are communicating the important health messages? It may be the doctor, but it could be someone like the nurse or the medical assistant or the scribe or someone who perhaps has a different, I'm not saying better or worse, just different relationship with um, the patient. So that can be, for some people that, that, that kind of stuff is a little bit abstract or it's not concrete enough. So I thought maybe I'd just share some examples because we encounter health literacy um, um, related information all day, every day. We just don't always think about it. So here are some examples. Um, for example, if someone was reading a newspaper article about a recent salmonella outbreak, they have to be able to just basically, you know, read that print and understand some of that scientific language, like what's an outbreak, what's salmonella? What do these things mean? Or, you know, we talk about food and nutrition, particularly when we think about, you know, food insecurity being an issue of public health significance, right? Thinking about the amount of calories that are in something that everyone loves, like macaroni and cheese, right? You may say, oh, not a big deal. This has a hundred calories, but that box is also six servings. So if you don't do that math, you don't, you know, you, I could easily eat a box of macaroni and cheese. And that's, you know, a third of my intake for the day or whatever. Or knowing that sodium and salt really mean the same thing. And these are things that most of us with advanced training take for granted because we think, oh yeah, of course we know that. But you have to be able to kind of dig through jargon, do some basic math, understand how tables work. And the last example about using the words we use like severe or elevated, you have to have some understanding of level of risk, like which word is worse than the other. 
And again, we just, we throw out these words like it's nothing, but oftentimes people don't understand it and may not realize they don't, they don't understand it because they think they have a working knowledge of what some of the words we use mean. Um, good so far, if anyone has any questions, um, maybe Alexa will let me know, um, but um, that's just some basic background. Um, what, what is health literacy and what are the important contributions or contributing factors when we think about what impacts health literacy? Now, I would argue a lot of people, including health professionals, probably have a good sense about that information, but where people struggle often is, okay, but what do I do about it? Um, and we have to think about, you know, there are things we can do in terms of measurement in terms of capturing information from clients or patients, but also in the work we do in terms of how we communicate and how we develop uh, materials. So I'm going to talk about that. So one really good resource is uh, run by Boston University. It's called the Health Literacy Toolshed. Um, you don't need like a subscription or anything. It's just, you know, BU um, houses this online database and it includes um, all sorts of health literacy measures. I'm going to highlight a few that are like open access, public domain ones that you don't have to pay or worry about uh, copyright issues because several of them you do have to um, worry about that or pay for that. Um, and this database includes information for those of you that might be a little more interested in research about things like psychometric properties, which basically mean like how valid and reliable is the measure or how was it developed? How have other people used it? It's that kind of you know, library-like uh, database. So let me talk about three that are very commonly used and can easily be incorporated into like a registration intake process, a form, something like that. The first is what we call the RELM, which is an acronym that stands for Rapid Assessment of Adult Literacy in Medicine. So these are some instructions, but it's gonna make sense when I show it the next slide. You basically ask the patient or client to read as many words as they can. You start with the first word and you work your way all the way through. If they don't know, if it does, they don't know what it, how to read it, they just say blank or they just move on to the next word. You as the administrator, you're just marking what's right and what, what's wrong. Um, and if they can't, if they struggle for more than a few seconds, you just ask them to move on because we don't really want people to be struggling with this. This is not, um, it's not that kind of uh, test. So you basically, you start with fat, you work with disease, cancer, you know, you just work like a snake all the way till you get um, to the bottom of the third list. It looks like a lot of words, but you know, you can, someone who knows these words really could read them in a matter of a few minutes. So you're keeping track of which ones are right and which ones are wrong. And then these are 66 words. And basically based on the number of words they read correctly, it gives you a ballpark sense of where they may be. I'm gonna talk about some overall limitations because there are all limitations with these when, I, when I'm done talking about all three of them. So if someone, let's say gets a 50 out of 66, they're probably at a middle school reading level. Or if they're at a, you know, 1920, they're probably, you know, upper elementary school. So it's ballpark because then you may need to adjust how you communicate with that person based on their score of, these, of this assessment. So that's the realm. Now that's a long list. People, you know, um, don't like that, right? Because time is precious in, in a clinical setting. So there's also the short form um, of this. What the researchers found is that these seven words, behavior to jaundice, more or less will give you the same score as the, the, the 66 list um, version. And so you go, you know, uh, you know, read those seven words and here's, you know, how you would score it. So for example, if someone got a four out of the seven, you're talking about like a, you know, like a seventh grade reading level. And if they get all seven, that's pretty much like a high school reading level. So this much shorter, I don't think anyone can argue against me if I say everyone has like one minute really to read seven words. Um, Cause that, you know, often we hear, you know in a provider setting, everything's so busy. You have such small amount of time with your patient. How can I do one of these tests? It's seven words, easy. Um, and so that the, the realm short form is a very commonly used one. 
This is different. And the reason why I show the short assessment of health literacy, oh, now I can see the, um, the box. Okay. So the, the, the power of technology. Um, thank you, um, whoever posted that, because now I can see the, the chat box. Um, so let me, I'll just answer it. Uh, to, uh, so that's a really good question. Someone asked, you know, well, why would someone, um, you know, how do you how do you pose this to someone? And the way I would say, what I would say to the patient is, you say the same thing to everyone. You know, we're assessing um, we're assessing uh, health literacy amongst all our clients. Doesn't matter who you are. And so we're gonna we're gonna take just one minute of your visit to ask you to read a few words, and it's gonna help me communicate better with you. And that's better for everyone. That's better for you as my patient. That's better for me as a provider. It's really important to stress that this is for everyone. You're not self-selecting based on whatever th things you think are important, like age or race or preferred language or income or zip code. Who does this? You do it for everyone or you don't do it. That's kind of, that's the best practice really. Um, so thank you for asking that. This one, um, I show because it's also offered in Spanish. Not all of them have been translated and proven valid in other languages. Um, so this one is a little bit different. So you see the STEM words, one to 18 here from kidney to syphilis. Um, and then there's a keyword and a distractor. So for each word, like for kidney, um, the, the keyword is urine. Occupation, it's work. And so everything can be right or wrong, right? Anything don't know is automatically wrong. Cause there is a right answer, which is I believe the, my next slide here. Um, and so this is, I'm not, I'm not showing the Spanish version right now but there's a Spanish version of this. And this is graded very easy. You don't have to worry about which score is which level of school. This is if you're a zero to 14, it's low. If it's a 15 to 18, it's considered average um, in terms of um, health literacy. Um, so it's just a different tool. And oftentimes people will test a few. You might, you know, want to take a few patients or clients and say, try, you know, one with some, try another, get some feedback before you make a decision about implementing something much, uh, you know, wider scale. So I show that one because it has English and Spanish. This one happens to be my favorite um, because it combines both reading and basic math. And you know, numeric literacy is just as important when it comes to health and medicine as health literacy. And this is like a script. So someone, someone, uh, the previous person just asked about what would you say. A, a lot of these do have little scripts that come with them. Obviously, you can make you know put them in your own words. So you know, we're asking our patients to help us learn how patients can understand the medical information doctors and providers give them. Would you be willing to look at some information, answer a few questions? So that's just kind of a way you can, you can pose, um, you know, the, the setup to this. Now, what you show them is on the left. You as the um, administrator have what's on the right. And so you can see the, the, the questions and of course, you know, the correct answers are here. Um, uh, so you go through one, two, three, and four. So for example, if you eat the entire container, how many calories? Someone may look at this and say, oh, easy, 250, but it's four servings, right? So 250 times four is a thousand. That's how you get a thousand. So you do one, two, three, four. And then um, you say, uh, pretend that you're allergic to penicillin, peanuts, latex gloves, and bee stings. Now you ask five and six, and then you get a score. They get it right or wrong, zero to six, and you see on the bottom what the scores mean. So like I said, I like this because it involves a table, some numbers, and reading. Um, and it's only six questions. Uh, so um, it's a little different, but like I said, all of them have been widely used. All three of them that I've just shown you have been widely used. Um, I think you need to kind of test them out a little bit um, and do a little bit of a pilot if you want to, if you want to consider implementing it. Um, uh, so that's those are three again commonly used um, assessment tools. Now I mentioned earlier. All tools have limitations, which are really important to acknowledge. The first is just because I understand, understanding of words does not equal educational level. I know this is a little blurry to see, but basically, you know, 
this is a problem in you in American school systems and in higher education, where you know you have people with high school degrees, bachelor's degrees, sometimes even graduate degrees, who are not good readers, um, and they may progress throughout the school system and even advance a higher education, but they still struggle with some of those things. So we can't assume because someone answers on a registration or intake form that they have they're a college graduate or they have a professional degree that this is not that this doesn't apply to them that would be very short-sighted of us to kind of just assume because someone is educated that they are have a high level of, of health literacy the other limitation is just because i i can say the word diabetes or jaundice does not mean i have any idea what those words mean um and uh <laughs> which is you know um which is just a fact, there's a limitation. Every test has a limitation, but these are to give you ballpark estimates um, and to help do the things, which is the next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about, about you know, what you can do in practice to kind of um, address issues of health literacy. So they all have them, um, you, know, you can uh, search these or use that um, health literacy tool shed if you want to kind of look for others. But you know, th these are, we've done really good work in terms of developing short, concise, um, and precise tools that can really assess health literacy. So you know, you have some background, you know what health literacy is, you know what contributes to health literacy, you know how you can measure it. There are plenty of tools. I gave you three examples. The next question that one would ask is, so what do you do about it? So let's say you implement this and you're, you're finding that, you know, half or the majority of your patients have a middle school reading level or an elementary school reading level. What can you do? There are some easier things we can do, some like low hanging fruit. And then there are things that take a little more time, investment and resources. And so I'm gonna share some of that uh, with you. Now, this may seem like, duh, why is he even saying this? using plain language, living room language. Um, but I'll tell you just even from my own experience uh, with my primary care provider, with a few specialists, with my dentist, right? That people are not intentionally, but it's just, they have so much training in their specific area of, of content expertise that those are the words that come out of their mouth. And so, you know, I was, I was talking to a friend who said, oh, my doctor um, diagnosed me with hyperlipidemia, but I have no idea what that is. So, you know, they were going on Google and, you know, we all use Google. I'm just as, you know, um, the person who's also Googling things to, to see what we can find out. But, you know, if we were to explain things using living room language, plain language, a lot of issues would be resolved. And so these are some just best practices. I'm gonna talk about visual aids in a moment. But I would say, you know, talk as if you're talking to your friend, right? And you're sitting on the couch watching TV, not, but not it with your white jacket on or your stethoscope or whatever, right? Or what are the things that, the, that your patient really needs to know versus nice to know? Sometimes, you know, we just spout out everything we know because we feel like, well, this person's come to see me. I need to kind of showcase my advanced training, my knowledge. And that might be important in some circumstances, but in the, probably the average encounter is not as important. Um, and the third one I would point out, just to highlight a few, is really giving information in small chunks and then pausing. Um, and I'm going to go. To, I think it's, it might even be the next one um, because you know I know I'm as guilty of this, and I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. I teach you know at the university that I could talk for two hours about a lot of things. But that doesn't mean that I should be doing that or the people who are listening just because they're nodding their head understand me. I do this happens all the time with my students. I'm like, do you have any questions? No. But then I start asking questions they're like, well, I'm not really sure. Or I wrote two different things down or mm, I think I actually need you to repeat that again. So sometimes that extra engagement will uncover things uh, that you might not suspect. And sometimes we get resistance about using plain language. People feel like it's unprofessional or inaccurate or it's dumbing down information that, you know, the patient has chosen me as their, you know, someone they respect and trust. And why would I dumb down information? It's actually a much uh, more difficult skill set to turn complex, particularly medical information into plain language. 
Um, because you're right, every physician has gone through, you know, college and medical school, residency, fellowships, whatever, they have that knowledge. But can you actually turn that knowledge into something that a common person, a lay person, the public can understand, truly understand to the point where they can explain it back to you? Um, the other important thing to note here is sometimes uh, providers will say, well, I do that, but for people who I know English is not their primary language. I would argue that everyone needs this, regardless if English is their first, second, third, or fourth language. Um, it's just a good practice. The other thing we should all be doing, um, and um, I, this is the example I just gave, is teach back. So I just told you, you know, three, I'm making this up now, right? Three reasons why it's so important to take your cholesterol lowering medication every day, every single night before you go to bed. Can you tell me in your own words um, those what those three reasons were? That way you have confirmation that just because someone's nodding their head or saying, oh yeah, sure, whatever, that they truly understand that. I go, and, and this has happened to me too. The last week I went to the vet to bring my dog. She wasn't feeling well. The, the vet, you know, is rattling off these two medications. So, oh yeah, don't worry. It's on the prescription bottle. I'm like, I'm reading the bottles. I'm like, they are contradicting each other. One's like, you know, 30 minutes after she eats. One's two hours after this. I was like, I have no idea the scheduling of this. Can you actually just draw it on a piece of paper? Like here's Monday, here's the morning, afternoon and night and just tell me what I need to do this. Um, and she was in such a rush because there was like three other people waiting and it was just a very rushed encounter. But, you know, I felt, you know, um, I could advocate for myself and ask that, but I know that's not everyone's uh, situation. And the reason why we promote teach back method is because a lot, everyone, again, it doesn't matter how educated you are, many people, most people really will forget information after they leave their appointment. And when people think they remember, oftentimes they don't remember the correct information. Um, or, you know, like me, I'm like, oh yeah, it's in my head. Of course, I'm gonna remember this. And I, by the time I get home, I'm like, wait, what? You know, so now I started like texting myself in stuff when I'm in the appointment or I have a little sticky note that I write things down and shove it in my pocket. But, you know, doing teach back methods can really uncover a lot of things, not just that I don't understand the information, but perhaps in what I tell you, say back to you, you may get a better understanding of who I am as a person, what I value, what I believe in, um, um, how satisfied are, am I or not with the kind of quality of ser services I'm getting. And it just may open up another cold dialogue with that person um, that didn't exist before. So it's just kind of, you know, um, a best practice. People also are concerned sometimes that it's, um, it's like a test, like I'm quizzing you now and you better get these things right. And that's not the point of this. Just like the point of the health literacy assessments is not to give someone a score and tell them they failed a test or something. It's to help make that encounter the best possible encounter for everyone. I don't care who you are, if you're the surgeon or you're the person opening the front door at the practice, everyone's treated the same. And so these are some ways that you can kind of pose the teach back method in a very non-confrontational, um, you know, friendly manner. Like, you know, I want to be sure that I did a really good job explaining everything today. Can you tell me, you know, enter, you know, whatever you were talking about or very, you know, specific questions like what foods are you going to avoid while you're taking this medication? You know, just to get a sense of have they actually heard, process that information and can say it back, you know, in their own words. Um, so we have, you know, um, using plain language and teach back methods. Visual aids are also can be um, a really good tool because everyone has different learning uh, preferred learning styles. Some of us really need to read things. Some of us need to hear things. Some of us need to see things. And some of us need a combination of all of that. And, you know, the good part about, you know, working in the health and human services field is there are thousands of visual aids out there. Some are kind of free to download and print. Some of them you need to buy, like more like the models. But, you know, we're not short of visual aids in the health science medical professions. And it can really help, particularly um, um, when you're talking about kind of uh, pathology or disease progression or how the body changes over time. 
I was just with a group of um, community health workers um, recently, and we were talking about um, hepatitis C and viral hepatitis and how the liver changes, you know, based on the things we do and, uh, you know, which diseases you have. And in this case, we're talking about uh, uh, hep C and just showing pictures and the visual aids of how the liver changes. Um, you know, I could just see people's like eyes were like, what? <laughs> like, you know, thinking you have like a virus can mean nothing, but actually seeing how it impacts the body can, you know, you know, a picture is really wor worth a thousand words. Um, and so depending on kind of what area of, of, of medicine you work in, um, like I said, there probably are a lot of tools out there. Some obviously have cost to them, but I, I, I do think they go a long way. And then the last one is really about designing educational materials. Now, the good news is there are a lot of existing tools and flyers and tip sheets and brochures out there in the universe. You do have to make sure that they're done well at the appropriate reading level, which I'll talk about as part of this design uh, section. Um, but oftentimes we do need, if we particularly, you know, we're talking about different languages or things specific to a local geographic area or, you know, practice, et cetera, um, you may need to design your own. Um, and so there are best practices when it comes to that, including, you know, thinking about who your target audience is, what they want to know about, what are the really key must know messages, not the nice to knows, obviously drafting it, showing maybe a sampling of clients that draft to get their feedback, um, and then evaluate how useful it is actually in practice. And, you know, I know this seems like, uh, like, duh, of course we would do this, but making the message clear um, is an art. There's really, you know, this is something that, you know, there's only so much you can learn, but, you know, you do so much, you go so much further by practicing it. And so when we think about making messages clear, we think about limiting the number of messages um, again, these are things I've kind of already mentioned, telling the audience what they need to know, what they'll gain from being a user of that or reading that information, and keeping things as short and concise as possible. Uh, a lot of the best practices I mentioned earlier. Now, a really good thing that you can do, and you do it once and then just stays in your computer, is checking off the readability. Um, uh, so if you have a Mac or if you have a PC, it's, it's different, but it, you can just even Google it after just readability on your, whatever computer you have, and it'll change the way it'll give you more information when you run a spell check. I'm going to show you an example in a second. And so it, the, the default is it's not checked, but once you check it, it will remain in, in place until you not, until you don't check it. Um, so um, before I show you the example, I'll tell you that it gives you two pieces of information. It gives you grade level is the first one, and grade level is measured from zero to 18. Um, so it's basically up through like um, if someone were going to college, right? So you think of 12th grade, high school, and then there's a little bit more. Um, and so the goal in general for health information is generally a middle school reading level. Doesn't matter who you're, because that kind of accounts for like the high school people, the elementary school reading people, it's kind of like in the middle. So on average, I tell people really to shoot for a sixth, seventh, eighth grade at max reading, uh, grade level, excuse, excuse me. The second thing it gives you is reading ease, how, you know, how easy it is. In this case, the higher the score, the better. They're kind of the opposite, right? The, the grade level and the reading ease. And so in general, you wanna shoot for somewhere between like 60 and 70. It's a ballpark. If it's a little less, a little higher. So it gives you grade level in reading ease. So now let me show you an example. I copied this, you know, copy and pasted this from the HRSA website about um, federally qualified health centers. So take a second to read it. Um, it's, it seems pretty straightforward, but just take a second to read it. Okay, so if I were to take this and run it in spell check with that readability box checked, you see in the bottom what it gives you. 
it, it tells you the grade level is about 16 out of 18 and the reading ease is 30. Now, remember, I told you the reading ease needs to be about like 60 to 70 and the grade level needs to be like sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So this is too advanced for the average person to be reading it. Now, I would, I'm guessing, you know, the average person is not going to the HRSA website and reading it, but you know, that just shows you something as simple as checking that box on your spell check can give you a sense of, you know, how your writing um, could be communicated to the public. And so you could change things. You can, you can, we're not gonna do that now for time's sake, but you can swap out some of those words or phrases and you'll see the numbers will change. So the next time you write something in Word, you'll have that checked and you'll see, is it good reading grade, you know, grade level, reading ease, based on your audience, do you wanna make some adjustments for that? Pretty simple thing we can do. And that note, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, as a reminder, you know, we went over what health literacy is, what factors contribute to health literacy, how you can measure it, and some pretty simple things you can do to impact health literacy. If there are any questions, you can just drop them in the Q&A box or the chat box, and I'll be happy to read them. We do have a question uh, that came in via email, and uh, the person basically posed the question, how do you think health literacy levels affect people's decision to get the COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and it's something I've definitely thought about because this is something you know I care about. When I see all of, even things like commercials or websites or print materials that are encouraging people you know, to get vaccinated, to reduce vaccine hesitancy, to build vaccine confidence, they're not following the, a lot of these principles, yeah. right? Because you're, you're using words. And I had my students do this. They're like, oh, this was easy. Of course I can do this. They developed a COVID information sheet and they were like shocked by the grade level and reading ease because they were using things like, um, words like pneumonia, SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, uh, zoonotic disease. I mean, these words that, you know, I understand as a health professional, but the average person is not going to understand that. And so, you know, it's one of those things, once you start, once you check that readability box and you run your spell checks, you'll be quite surprised. Now, if you're talking to a professional audience, maybe it's not as important, but we're talking about to the public, lay people, it certainly is very important. Even for things like websites that are supposed to be, you know, interfacing with the public, um, they're just, it's just, we're shooting up here and really the average person is, is really middle school, um, uh, grade level. So I think by implementing some of these, um, particularly with the print written material, um, it could definitely make a change with someone's health behavior. Absolutely. Thank you. Another, uh, another person asked, what advice would you give to a patient struggling with low health literacy levels due to a language barrier? So, um, with language barriers, um, there are a few things to keep in mind. One is, um, you know, have a good pulse of what the most commonly, what the, what the preferred languages are of your client. Because, you know, most people are gonna tell you they speak English and can understand English, but it might not be their preferred language. And so there can be some issues there when everything you're communicating verbally and writ in written uh, text is in English, but their preferred language might be something else. That can make a big difference. Um, you know, the larger kind of health systems have access to like these language lines and interpreters, but you know, most other kind of practice settings don't. Um, so, you know, I would also think about what materials you that already exist in other languages you can get including even videos, um, because even showing someone like a basic uh, video about something like COVID or hepatitis or whatever the case may be in their preferred language. Um, and considering we're doing a lot of communication electronically via text message and for email and, and um, you know, like apps, um, sending someone like a YouTube link or something like that can, you know, really go a long way. Obviously, you have to make sure that they're credible and that they're, you know, yep. accurate information. Yep, definitely. 
uh, another person asked, what happens when there are low health literacy levels throughout entire communities? And what is the best way to raise the health literacy level in a community? Yeah, I think if, I think if most people who work, you know, who serve a, a patient population or a client population would be surprised where their uh, literacy levels are for the people they serve. Um, like I said, because usually the surrogate measure is we ask people what their highest level of education is, and then we make assumptions based on that. And as I showed you earlier, that really doesn't hold true, particularly in the US. Um, um, and so we can't make assumptions based on how educated someone is. The first step is really to do one of those basic assessments. And it's not something you have to do every single visit. Um, I would build it into like a, a first time appointment or a first time, you know, registration intake kind of process. And then you collect that over a large enough population, it gives you something to work with. So you do it for, let's say a few months or a quarter, and then you take that data and look, okay, now we know where our client base is. Let's discuss what adjustments we have to make. The burden is on us as the organization, as the providers, not on the clients. And so what are we gonna do? Are we gonna start implementing teach back methods? Are we gonna start incorporating visual aids? A combination of those things in addition to plain language, you know, what, what um, mix of strategies are we gonna take on to address this issue? Um, and, you know, that's much easier said than done, particularly in larger institutions where change is uh, hard and difficult and takes a long time. Absolutely, thank you. Are there any other questions that our, our attendees want to ask? Nope, it doesn't look like it. So with no further questions, thank you so much, Dr. Sindela, for joining us tonight and for presenting on such an important topic. Stav, any closing remarks? And so thank you so much for your time and that this webinar will be available on all of our social media, our website and our YouTube channel. So. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye.